Thank you, Carl, and everyone from the Do Lectures. I want to talk about how lucky we are, how good our life is, and, and I think ours right now is probably better than virtually anyone's, um, and certainly better than it has been throughout history and better than most people around the world. You know, I have absolutely everything I need, and yet I have barely a fraction and absolutely no chance of ever acquiring all the things that I fleetingly and frivolously want. Throughout my life, we've been sort of growing up with the, the grow, uh, growth paradigm, just accepting that we have to move forward, we have to acquire more things, new things. Shopping is a legitimate hobby. Shopping is therapy. Shopping will make us happy. And convenience is the ultimate goal in, in buying anything. And I actually was quite involved in that in, in one sense. When I first started my publishing company in 98, my guides were about books, uh, or my books were about shops, unusual and interesting shops. I'd visited a few that really inspired me. There was one called Juggle Art in Fitzroy, and I went in to buy an ex-boyfriend at a unicycle, and the people in the shop sold all sorts of other circles and, and juggling equipment and they actually wouldn't let me leave the shop until they had taught me how to juggle. So it was a really beautiful experience. And then around the corner there was another shop called Art Holes. And I didn't actually get the joke for a very long time. <laughs> they sold mirror frames so I kind of got it. You know, the art is on the outside and the hole is in the middle. And but they used incredible materials, so they used you know, red onion skins and, and made that into a frame that looks like a sort of walnut. They had recycled um, basketball courts that they also used for frames, and they were just quite fascinating. And the books grew and grew, and to the point that I you know, became quite interested in absolutely everything everyone was doing, whether it was you know, a fetish wear latex maker, the hunter-gatherer instinct in me wanted to just acquire a little bit of something from all of these retailers because they had this incredible singularity of, of focus and passion and intensity. And I realised, you know, that it's just not practical or financially viable for me to sort of get a little bit of all of these places, these souvenirs. So I had to just take a deep breath and accept that I just had to be satisfied with what I had. But I also had these books, I had these pictures, I had these stories, and I knew who these people were. I knew where I could find these things. And that was quite comforting. But when I was in my late teens, I uh, had a, an autoimmune disease. Technically, I still have it, but I've been in remission for a very long time. Uh, but I had lupus. And before it was diagnosed and before I had pain relief medication, my whole body was just racked with arthritis. So every movement was painful and difficult. And I developed a, a profound appreciation for the simplicity of design, where you have classic taps, for example. There's a hot and the cold, left and right, red and blue, marked, curved, and comfortable surfaces to turn on and turn off. It actually made my life so much easier, even though it's something we take for granted now. The harsh, modern ones didn't work so well. They were painful to use. So I've always appreciated simple design, and it can be elegant as well. And so throughout my business, I've tried to make sure that what I do gives just enough design. The de design doesn't dominate, no single element dominates, but it, it all contributes and enhances. So my publishing company, Deck of Secrets, produces guides to cities and now islands for locals and for, for visitors in a deck of cards format. And so the idea with the deck of cards is it, it's a very simple concept. You think books are something that everybody accepts and understands, but cards are a plaything. And so it's been very 
inspiring for me to see people just pick them up instantly have their personal way of relating to it and making order or chaos, whichever they prefer. But also realising people who aren't literate or aren't comfortable with books. We may not know those people, but it's something that they also feel comfortable with. One other aspect I've been fairly keen to avoid is talking about things being the best and the greatest, because I don't think that really serves anyone. I think we all have our own opinions and great for someone is not great for someone else. So I try to provide just the right amount of information for people to make their own decisions about what's good and interesting for them. And so we have a beautiful image, ideally clear, text that's descriptive and informative. I always have a logo as well. And I think a lot of people may have interpreted a logo being included in a, in a printed published product as <laughs> advertising. But it's actually not advertising. It's been very deliberate so that I'm hoping your mind will see the logo so that when you're in a foreign place or a local place, your subconscious, your peripheral vision will see this and help take you there much more directly. I do believe that the good design with the logo can communicate a great deal as well. So part of my life's journey, I suppose, recently has been about minimisation. I don't move home very often, but the last time I did it was quite traumatic and I realised just how much I'd acquired. A lot of it really just paper. And so over the last six years or so I've been digitising everything that can be digitised, getting rid of things I don't need and just resisting more. It's a journey, I don't think I'll ever get there because there's too many opportunities to acquire more things. We all have some lovely new things now, new books, new shoes, etc. Uh, but I'm fairly confident that I'm going in the right direction and that in a, in a sense is a, a relief to me because in the other direction requiring more, you're never going to get there. It's, it's a complicating factor in life and I believe it sort of diminishes the quality of life somewhat. So. In addition to minimising possessions for my business, I also, in a sense, gave up my, my office and I don't have any staff, no permanent staff. I hire people as required. And so with this newfound freedom, I've essentially been nomadic for the last four years or so. And when you carry everything in a suitcase for up to 10 months of the year, you make do with what you have. You realise you don't need so much, you just get by, you adapt, and it's, it's quite liberating. So I'm also looking to create um, simplicity in personal habits. So I, I suppose there's a, a kind of uniform approach to the clothes that I wear. And when I go shopping, I'm looking for things that can be worn in multiple situations, things that are lightweight, things that pack small, things that can be washed easily, washed infrequently, things that are worth repairing. These things can all be found, and they're often found in, in quality, in things that are made, handmade, crafted, local, traditional, etc. And so these things actually make my life better. Anything that doesn't really conform to that, I find inconvenience and a, a happiness suck. So um, <laughs> I'm also looking at simplicity of choice. You know, when you do lead a simple, a more simple life, going to something like a supermarket, which is incredibly every day, can be quite overwhelming and terrifying. Toothpaste in particular needs to have two things, fluoride and an abrasive action. You really can't buy bad toothpaste. But we're sold on the idea of having all these different kinds as if the complexity built into the product or built into the process is a substitute for having genuine expertise, knowing what makes sense and what doesn't. So you can buy what you may think is a better tube of toothpaste, but without knowing that you really should be brushing for six minutes if you've got a manual brush, two perhaps if you've got uh, an electric one, but flossing is going to make much more difference than anything else. So it's this simplicity of choice and just accepting that. So these days I look to the bottom shelf, the brand that doesn't make ridiculous promises, the brand that doesn't advertise, and it's just I have more energy to make decisions about things that do matter. I'm also looking at simplicity of ownership, which is what uh, Cole was sort of implying before. 
uh, Airbnb, couch surfing, uh, two new ways of, of travel and, and um, I suppose interacting with travellers. So I own my own home, but strangers live there more than I do. In fact, there's one there now. I've got lots of possessions out, exposed, and I trust that those people will look after my possessions. But I also accept that if they don't, they are just possessions. They're not that important. And I'm looking into simplicity of technology as well and strongly believe that progress shouldn't just be continuous, that it should be continuous improvement, not just an evolution of features design. I don't think we really make much use of the features that we do have for so many things at the moment. If you consider any coffee table, you could have up to half a dozen remote controls, each with between 40 and 60 buttons. Personally, that's not what I want to look at in my downtime. It's, it's overwhelming. But if you look back to BlackBerry in its earliest days, it was revolutionary. It was sort of like the first smartphone. Compared to how smartphones are these days, I don't really believe it is a smartphone, but I do believe it is the best portable email device. It's cheap to run, it's lightweight, it's got good battery life. I think as an email device, an email still is what we use as much as most other platforms, nothing beats it. And I just hope it survives and regains its focus so that we can perhaps consider having two devices if that does actually simplify our lives. Probably the aspect of simplification that I'm most passionate about and have to fight for um, personally against temptation, against advertising, is the simplicity of, of nutrition and of eating. And at the D lectures, we've eaten incredibly well. Beautiful, simple food. I don't think anyone has missed any of their favorite things from home. So years ago, there was the documentary called Food Inc. And since that screened, I can't think about, I've never tempted by um, junk food. But it was actually giving up sugar a few years ago that's been the single most simplifying factor in my diet. Virtually everything from a supermarket, but everything pre-packaged has sugar. Sweet things, savoury things, neutral things, they all almost have sugar. So by just accepting that you have to eat fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, you're just naturally going to be a lot healthier. Interestingly, this time last year exactly, I gave up food altogether. It wasn't um, something I'd really thought about, it wasn't a desperate thing, it was fasting. I was in Bali and I met with a, an ex uh, ANSET colleague of mine, a pilot who every year before he had his health check to counter his extremely hedonistic ways would go to Bali and for two weeks he would just fast. All he would have is water and a single coconut each day, possibly some multivitamins, but that's essentially it. So. He'd done that. It was his 60th birthday that year, and so it looks like he wasn't going to do it. He was going to indulge. And so he was kind of encouraging me to consider it. And so over breakfast that morning, I thought, I'll give it a go. And at first, it seemed like it was going to be ambitious to give up food for two weeks. It seemed ridiculous. So I thought I'd start with four days, then seven, and then see how I went. And it's actually quite easy. Um, after 36 hours, you stop feeling hungry. Your body realizes food's not going to be coming from here, and it looks to the body to find other sources of energy. And so I had a full two weeks of no food, and I felt absolutely fine. Nothing bad happened. And you do notice your body a little bit more. If anything, life becomes almost too simple. You don't realize the impact of having three meals a day, or five, or six. That was the hardest thing, trying to break up my day into uh, meaningful patterns without meals. But you realize, um, by doing what seems quite impossible, quite ridiculous, that it is quite possible. And it can be quite healthy as well. And so you accept that you don't need all the things you've got accustomed to. So doing without these comforts has actually been quite comforting to know that you will be okay. You don't have to fear what will happen if this happens or that happens. 
I'm also quite passionate about simplicity of waste, and this has come about being brought up by pre-baby boomer parents, parents for whom nothing was wasted, not heat, not light, not food, not even glad wrap. We used to recycle that. And so for a family of four, we had an Oscar the Grouch sized rubbish can that was just cleared every week and we probably filled it halfway, if that. Now I've got one bin this big for recycling, another bin this big for general waste. And this is just for me, collected every day, every week. And so I think it's almost as if it's a, a challenge rather than a deterrent. And uh, I think Melburnians in particular, but Australians in general, have resisted the whole um, I can see the logo, that big coffee chain. Starbucks. Starbucks. We've resisted Starbucks, and yet Australians have actually embraced George Clooney and the whole Nespresso thing. We've bought into the whole convenience of this product, but it's just created this entire new waste stream. To me, logically, it just, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And I think anyone who's um, participated in the Market Lane Coffee workshop may have learned how to use the AeroPress supposedly a superior manual coffee maker that has no waste. Why choose a product that creates waste almost instantaneously when we don't have to? And there is, I don't want to call it a conspiracy, but certainly big business in many ways has a very vested interest, Nestle with Nespresso, but it goes a lot further. Um, when I was in Malaysia a while ago, I read an article in a women's magazine by chance and it talked about this thing called a menstrual cup. Never ever heard of such a thing, such a, a whole new product category. But it's something that replaces tampons. So if you imagine how many women use how many tampons every month, and these can be replaced by one silicon cup that lasts 10 years. To me, we should all know about this. It should be an option. We should be able to buy it in a supermarket. It just seems incredible. But there are so many businesses built up around selling them, making them, disposing of them. So even things that we think of that don't have any alternative could actually have an alternative to minimise waste. And we might think of it you know, as just part of our routine of buying something, <coughs> using it, throwing it in the bin, getting rid of it. But it is actually a complication of life. It's actually not convenient. So back to my business, which has gone through a whole lot of challenges lately. Uh, when I started uh, my product in a deck of cards format just over 10 years ago, I kind of had the space to myself. There wasn't too many people doing anything like that. Internet, of course, was going, but there weren't as many blogs. There weren't as much competition. Things got really tough lately. Australia in particular has lost a lot of bookshops. It's a very crowded market. But I've come back to sort of a core of what I do, and it is all about identifying those business owners, now restaurants and bars, that have that singularity of vision and understanding that visitors and locals always want to find these most authentic businesses that have you know, the experience that they <laughs> offer that feels most, more, most authentic. So focusing in on that again and starting uh, to build my business almost from scratch again is what I'm doing this year. So I just wanted to finish by saying um, simplicity is something that I think we should pursue over growth, over progress and over what we think of as convenience but acknowledging that we really do have to, to fight for it and if we do fight for it I believe we'll be happier with our less complicated lives, less things to provide anxiety, far less impact on the environment but also it means that we have a life and a lifestyle that's much more like you know that small boat that can maneuver across the seas to experience new things, to accept new opportunities. We're not so invested in our possessions and in our processes. And we can live a lot simpler without actually compromising quality, relationships. If anything, it actually makes us more human. We observe more, we participate more, we connect more. So I just want you to um, yeah, consider your lives and have you missed anything here in the wilderness in Australia? 
you've pretty much had everything you need. You've had heat, you've had warmth, you've had companionship, you've had beautiful food, great conversations, inspiration. Do we need all these other things? Thank you.